Welcome to the Grace Writers Podcast, Christian writers changing popular culture. Hit subscribe on your favourite podcast player so you never miss an episode. And find show notes, useful links and a full transcript at gracewriters.com. Today on the podcast, we welcome young adult Christian fantasy author and youth worker, Kristen Young. I'm Belinda Pollard. I'm an author, editor and writing coach with a theology degree and 20 years in the publishing industry. Find links to my blogs, books and online courses at belindapollard.com. Hi, I'm Alison Young. I'm a former early childhood teacher. I have four adult children and I live in South East Queensland. I write romance under the pen name Alison Joy and you can find all my information on alisonjoywriter.com. Hello, I'm Danita Bundy, and for the last 20 years, I've been using my theology degree to inform my preaching and teaching, and more recently, my writing and blogging. You can find out more about me at donitabundy.com. Kristen Young is an author of fiction and non-fiction, a ministry worker and a speaker. Her speculative fiction debut, The Apprentice, won Book of the Year in the 2021 Realm Maker Awards. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and her book on doubt, What If, was shortlisted for Australian Christian Book of the Year. Welcome to the Grace Writers Podcast, Kristen. Thanks for having me. We'd like to ask you the rapid fire five to start with. Are you ready? Yes. Who is your target audience? My target audience tends to be um, young adults and teens, although my writing gets shared by people of many age groups. So whoever enjoys reading the words, really. And what is your main genre? Uh, I started in nonfiction. My first writing was uh, devotions and books for Christian teens in that genre. But uh, in, uh, five years ago, I switched across to fiction. And so my current main genre is young adult speculative fiction. The series at the moment is uh, science fiction dystopian. When is your optimum time for writing? I'm a morning writer. Um, I live at home with my husband and three kids, dog and multiple budgies, and uh, the best time for writing is in the morning before any of them wake up. That sounds fair. Where is your favourite place to write? Uh, My desk. I'm sitting at the moment. Um, It's Yeah, it faces a window and it's a beautiful space to write. I, I love that. That sounds lovely. How did you get into writing? Now, this is just the short answer because I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about this as we go on. (laughs) Um, I've always loved writing, um, but I for many years felt that there was no future in it and so I went off and did something else for a while. But it's been a passion for a long time. That's speaking to me. (laughs) So, Kristen, how did you decide what you were going to write? Like you've got fiction and you've got nonfiction, so how did they come about? The nonfiction started um, from a pastoral perspective. So I was working with a group of teenage girls mostly and they all, like a cohort of them all, hit the HSC, their, their final year exams. And so the first book that was published was aimed at helping them to survive through the, the final years of high school with their faith intact. Um, the fiction kind of grew out of, my as I was watching society, I was kind of noticing that uh, sermons and non-fiction works were less persuasive on our psyche than than stories. Stories fly under the radar. They encourage us, and they actually, while we're being entertained, they actually model and sh- and shape us. I love that what you've raised there about the storytelling and the power of storytelling. And one of the things that I'm constantly recalling is that we worship a storyteller. Yeah, absolutely. Jesus told stories all the time. Mm. Totally, yeah, yeah. And we, I mean, we turn that into sermons where we say, well, you know, we talk about the parable of the sower and we we then kind of break it down into its little component parts. But the things that actually captivated people's hearts were the stories and it was a case of, you know, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. For some people, they were just entertaining stories. For other people, they were life-changing and life-giving. I'm not the son of God. Um, But I would hope to be able to point towards him in that same life-giving way. So it's kind of a parable, carrying a message. My story is a very um, parable-like story. But I think 
sometimes even just the the characters that we watch in our entertainment help to shape our opinion of different things. Yeah. That's one of one of the reasons that I actually founded Grace Riders initially, because I see the power of popular culture to mm. shift. Society is like the Battlestar Galactica and you can't turn it on a dime, but you can, mm. you know, a few little few little thruster boosts here and there and you can gradually over time change the direction of it. And we have seen popular culture change the direction of society in profound ways, certainly in the past couple of decades. And I think it's time as people of the book that we can take some of that back. I think for a long time we've lagged behind popular culture in many ways um, because within the church particularly, I think there's been a devaluing of story that's allowed mainstream culture to kind of overtake us. And there's a lot of there's a lot to be said for systematic theology and, and making sure that our theology is is truthful and correct and all that sort of thing. But I think while we're focusing on dogmatic statements and doctrinal issues, the popular culture has basically done evangelism for us in the sense that if you look through popular culture, they the the stories that people have been engaging with have told them what Christians look like. Um, they've told them what to expect from the church. And so when we step up and say, actually, that's not correct, what you expect from the church is this, they've already had their hearts captivated by the stories. Mm. And so they're not listening because the stories have shaped their worldview. You watch TV, murder mysteries, and if you find, like, who are the church people? They're the crazy ones or the boring ones or the, you know. So they're, even if they're side characters within popular, you know, storytelling mediums, they're still shaping people's understanding of what the church looks like, what Christians look like, what matters to Christians. A lot of the mainstream messages that are coming out about Christians, about Jesus, about the Bible, nobody's actually listening to the actual Christians. They're, they're just sort of, you know, the stories are telling them what to think. They're caught up in the stereotype. Yeah, they're creating stereotypes. So, Kristen, what um, process do you follow for your writing? My main process, I, I generally start with um, it's like a seed of an idea, which is the con conceptual idea that then develops into a vague plot, which then develops into a more um, structured plot. And then when I start writing, the characters decide to do their own thing and I throw out the structure and I end up trying to wrestle it back to the end. Um, so we do get there in the end, but it's it's a, a little bit of a hybrid process between plotting and pantsing. <laughs> makes sense. Which one do you think you lean more towards? I think I, I possibly lean, I, I prefer the structure. I can't sit down and just write anything, you know, like I, I, I need to have a structure and I guess I, I renovate the structure as I go through. I actually heard someone describe it as um, patchwork quilting. So you've yeah. got your structure and then you just chop it up and you mix and match it and it, you actually are a quilter. That's good. I like that. Yeah. So how do you fit your writing process in around your life and your career? Uh, it's been fun and interesting. Um, for a while, when I, I think when I, the Lord blessed me with the opportunity to hone my writing skills for a couple of years. I was sort of full time as a mum and volunteer in, in church circles. And I wrote, I'd say, three or four practice novels that I look back now and think, oh my goodness. Um, Do you think you might resurrect any of those? Yeah, the next, the next series is a resurrection of the concept of one of them, but not I'm jettisoning the writing because it's horrible. <laughs> um, yeah, but the concept's still coming back. I've had part-time work for, well, part-time pay paid work for the last couple of years. And so my writing process has had to be flexible to fit around the edges of that. So there's, it's been much more of a battle to um, set up appropriate boundaries to, to give me the time to write. I've had to learn how I work 
um, and and what conditions I need to organise so that I can have the creative juices flowing. And I think the getting up early in the morning is one that's actually really helped. But I, I work three days a week for um, a gap year program at the moment um, with young people, and that's quite full on for those times. So I try and carve out the other days to be able to write around the edges. When it comes to publishing, how did you go about finding a publisher? Do you have an agent? Uh, you know, and I'm you've published in multiple genres. So could you maybe give us a little outline of how that worked for each one? Sure. Um, the first one was a happy accident. I've, I've realised one of one of the ways I work is that I'll put together a first draft of something and then I'll think it's the most fabulous thing that's ever been seen. And in my early years, I would just send it off to everybody going, hey, this is, I've done a thing. You want to look? Um, and most of the time people would go, no, I don't. Well, that's no, I don't like that. Um, I think this is one of the pitfalls that early writers often fall in because you're just so excited that you've actually completed something that you just think I've now got to shop it around to all of the um, publishers immediately um, without taking the time to make sure that it's actually worth reading. The devotions went, I sent to a, a publisher and um, there was a wonderful woman who was working there at the time who said, I actually really like this concept. I think that's really nice. Can we work together and put it into something? And so that that kind of happened. Um, I think it, it fit a niche at that point. There wasn't really anything for late high school, you know, people surviving exams and how to deal with that. And so it, it, it managed to find that happy accident of need and opportunity. Fiction was a longer process. Apprentice, while I was writing it, I did some investigations of what was actually out there, the publishers out in the mainstream. Um, because it's overtly Christian, uh, the first one's kind of crossover, but but then later on it becomes very, very overtly Christian in terms of the messages that it gives. I knew that it had to find a Christian publisher and the only place for those is the US. And so I did you know, research, found out um, an enclave, even while I was writing it, Enclave seems to be the best fit as far as publishers go. Um, but I thought I'm never going to get it in front of them properly. They had submission processes, but I thought I'm never, I'm never going to get it in front of these guys properly unless I go to the US, but I can't afford to go to the US. So I kind of just handed it over to the Lord and said, well, I'll just keep writing, see what happens. It it won the Omega Prize for Best Unpublished Manuscripts, which got me a free manuscript assessment. And um, Yola, who was the editor who did it for me, she sent it back saying, it, it's kind of good. It starts a bit suddenly. Have you thought about, you know, changing the beginning so it has a backstory? And that then turned into two books beforehand. So what was supposed to be book one ended up being book three. Wow. And, um yeah, and so by the time I finished book one, I was at the point of thinking this could actually be something and I was just praying at that point about what to do and thinking, well, I can't, I know that I need to get it to Steve Lobby, but I can't get to America. What do I do? And that's when God brought Steve to Australia to the Amiga Writers Conference that year. So I jumped on board and I went, I've got to go. And, um, <laughs> and so I, I pitched it to him then. Um, which is another whole story. But um, at that point, he just he gave me a poker face and said, um, sure, just send the, the pitch to us. We'll see what we do about it. And I sent it off and six weeks later got an email saying, we'd like to publish this. Can you please? Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I, I wasn't quite as controlled then as I <laughs> it, it may have <laughs> It might have been screaming in the house, but it was it was happy, happy screaming. Yeah. That's wonderful. You've talked about the fact that you got the Omega unpublished manuscript, which gave you developmental editing on it. Did you do other phases of editing that you had to pay for before you submitted it, or was it more that they did it afterwards? What I realised over doing all of the practice novels that failed was that my perception of my writing wasn't the best gauge of whether something was ready to be published or not. 
Um, and so from an early point, I decided that before I even started presenting manuscripts to publishers, what I actually needed was objective eyes on the manuscript to be able to give me feedback that wasn't, wasn't from my family um, who were invested in being nice to me, um, but was able to actually look at the words and say, are these worth, is anybody going to think it's worth reading? So I, I paid for manuscript assessments before it even went to a publisher. And that's something I've tried to maintain. The publisher themselves, they have in-house editing, both developmental edits and copy edits, and there's multiple phases before it gets into a book. So strictly speaking, I, I could get away with not paying anybody. But I feel like it's a really important investment in the quality. If people are going to put their money into a book, I want to make sure they get one that's worth reading. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all for getting editors to look at it before it goes to the publisher. And how much creative control did you have after it went to the publisher? Um, a lot. Yeah, I um, the, the design on the front cover was based on a sketch that I put together of a concept that I had in the middle of the novel. But Enclave are brilliant. They're just amazing. They're, um, they'll give edits and I'm able to say no or yes to, to what's sent. Um, but it's, it's a partnership process, I think. There's a lot of consultation there in the way that I'm allowed to put forward concepts and ideas. I mean, I've never had to put my foot down about anything because I just trust them so much in terms of their ability. They know the market better, in, particularly in the US. They know the US market way better than I do. I mean, it sounds like you've got a really good relationship with them, which is wonderful. Do you, uh, how much of the marketing side of things do you have to look after versus how much they do? Um, I have to look after the, um, the social media well, some of the social media, so, so they, they, there is a social media arm of the publisher and they advertise things. But um, after the first one came out, I have to, um, well, I had to learn how to use Instagram properly and, and all of that sort of stuff. And I'm still learning. Um, but they put me through a bit of a social media boot camp at the beginning and <laughs> got me um, moving on that. Um they work with the distributors and all that sort of thing. So uh, I think that's one reason why I, I made the choice of going with a traditional publisher rather than self-publishing at that point. I wasn't up on the business side of, of publishing books. And, yeah, I didn't feel qualified to be able to take on that part of the business as well as the creative side. You said that Steve Lobby uh, took your manuscript on and represented you for your first manuscript or first book it's a whole series does he represent you for the whole series um steve is actually the owner of enclave publishing and so when i said he took me on he's taken me on as the publisher um and so i received a, a contract for a trilogy okay and so through that process you've been telling us that you've got a lot of autonomy in regards to the cover and things like that what about your actual like the grace notes those things in there that are um, getting your message across you said it started out as a crossover and then became overtly Christian later on um, have you had any trouble hanging on to those things that are important to you in that aspect of your writing not at all um, and I think that's why one reason why I spent so much time trying to find the right publisher. Um, mm -hmm. Enclave is a Christian publisher and they have a statement of belief on their main web page um, saying that this is their focus. Um, their desire is to print uh, Christian fiction um, in the speculative genres. And there are different levels of, of what Christian means in those yes. situations. But I think because there was a really definite Christian faith component, I knew that it wasn't ever going to find a proper place in a secular publisher. And yeah. so I specifically looked for a publisher who would 
um, provide that kind of space. Yeah, I, I guess it was more in, in terms of seeking out a, a business relationship where the um, the publishers were, you, you and the publisher were in alignment in that respect. Um, so obviously your faith plays a major part in your writing. Um, you, you said you pray through it. Uh, it's a big part of uh, the research and the avenue you took. I was just wondering, on this journey of, of being published, have, has your faith developed or grown or changed at all in this adventure? I think there were various challenges along the way in terms of making my decisions about, first of all, what sort of things I wrote and how I write them. You know, there's the temptation, I think, to, to seek after the material success of publishing to say, okay, you know, so there, there are lots and lots of schemes out there that are saying, you know, you follow this scheme and you'll earn this much money after this many books and, you know, um, so do it our way and you'll, you know, be successful. Mm. And there are secular publishers out there that are offering uh, monetary prizes and all sorts of things for works of fiction. Um, and the question at each point, as I was looking through changing from nonfiction to fiction, and then thinking about what I actually write, it was always a question of, am I willing to trust God with the writing process and persevere even if it doesn't necessarily mean that I will make, make, make the money out of it, you know, that sort of thing. You know, fiction these days is not the lucrative kind of option that it was many years ago. I was reading a biography of a woman who um, was born in Kirribilli, married an English lord or something and through her writing bought a mansion in Switzerland. I was like, more oh, nice. nice for some. I'm yeah. still waiting for my mansion in Switzerland myself, but well I can I can or I can buy a cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> all right. um, nice. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> doing well <Successful>. perhaps, <laughs> perhaps a jigsaw puzzle featuring a mansion in switzerland well that might be pushing it no yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those puzzles are expensive um yeah yeah no i i think the the challenge is to so there's a question of working through the issue of what what writing do i feel that i'm called to do and then being faithful to that particular kind of writing i think there are some people whose gifting and whose ability actually fits a secular space. Yeah. I guess because my first published works were Christian nonfiction, they were always going to be there with me. So if I went into the secular marketplace, my back catalogue was incredibly overtly Christian. And there was a question of whether, you know, secular publishing houses would even be okay with that. I didn't know. That was all unknown. Um, as, it, as it happened, I think one of my goals was I wanted to write a story that while it was entertaining and while it kept people's attention, I wanted to transmit the beauty of the gospel and sort of, I guess, demonstrate how captivating it can actually be without being corny or cheesy or, you know, schmaltzy. And, and in a way that, that helped young people to see that following Jesus is actually a life-giving thing. I mean, it's an alternate universe. And so instead of God the Trinity, I've got composer, lyric and muse. That's tricky as well because you're trying to write a piece of fiction and avoid getting into heresy. And, but <laughs> you're you. trying to transmit truths while you're trying to do entertaining plot yeah, and you're yeah. trying to do things that aren't you're trying to avoid all the tropes and failing and you know all that stuff so you you kind of it's it's much easier to write non-fiction I could write a bible study way before and much you know in much shorter amount of time than write a novel um, simply because I'm actually trying to weave all these different things together in a coherent package that people can listen to or read just as entertainment but is also actually something that gives us eternal truths um, and points people back to the bible you know there are cases where the mythology that's been put up has been so per persuasive that it's actually taken the place of the bible so you know people read tolkien even though tolkien would be horrified to think that people were treating his work as a bible um, because of his christian faith it's so persuasive that people have kind of got 
focused on the art instead of sidetracked of the message underneath it and so there's, there's all of these and I can overthink things all over the place you know <laughs> So kind of overthinkers anonymous oh t- yes totally i'm trying to put welcome to the writers plot. group <laughs> i know it's wonderful um yeah so i'm trying to put together a decent plot and trying to have it exciting and interesting and young adultish enough that it doesn't sound like a middle-aged person <laughs> saying hello young fellows let's be hip um and at the same time trying to teach you know talk about god when I'm not God, but I'm acting as God because I'm the narrator and the writer of this, you know. So it, there's all of these faith-related tensions that make the writing process harder, in a sense, but worth it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just finally, where to from here? I don't know. Um, I'm I'm praying that the Lord lets me write more. Um, I've just handed in book three of the trilogy. So I'm at Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Much blood, sweat and tears in that one. Um, Yeah, because I said, I think I said earlier that book three or book one ended up being book three, but then again, the trajectory of books one and two changed. And so I thought, oh, it's all right. I don't have to do much, but I had to change. I hear that. Um, It's a completely different book anyway. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think it, I'm at the moment where I'm now thinking, well, I'll move on to the next project um, and the next. I'm getting more familiar with the process of writing. I'm enjoying it. I love creating stories. I love melding together faith and stories. So I would love to be to have the opportunity to keep being able to um, write captivating stories that, are not just safe places for Christian teens to read, but also investigate the big issues along the way without being preachy. If you want to set yourself up a really difficult task, attempt to write a fiction book that talks about the gospel in a way that doesn't preach. It's it's hard. It's probably, I think if you had to give yourself a challenge in writing I would have to say that's probably the hardest challenge I've ever faced in writing Mm. a book is putting a gospel presentation into a story without it turning into a okay I'm just going to take you out of the narrative for a second so you can sit and watch a Billy Graham crusade and then we're going to insert you back into the plot. I've got to trust your reader to pick up on the subtleties of what you're saying Mm. That if God wants a particular person to get that message, then he will speak Mm. to them through our faltering words. And I felt the faltering a lot. Thank you so much for all of these insights, Kristen. How about I pray for you before we finish? Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Kristen and we thank you for the vision and the equipping and the possibilities that you have brought into her life. We thank you that she has been faithful to that and that she has stepped forward and written these books for you. We pray that you will continue to encourage her, that you will continue to use her words in the ways that you are planning to use them and in the people that you are preparing to read them. And we entrust it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Kristen Young, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Alison Joy and Danita Bundy as well. I'm Belinda Pollard, and we will see you next time on the Grace Writers Podcast. Grace Writers is run by volunteers, and we're incredibly grateful to those who have contributed financially to help keep this ministry running. Thank you so very much. If you have enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to help, please go to gracewriters.com and look for Donate in the menu. Continue today's conversation in our free online forum and find useful articles, links and resources at gracewriters.com.